Okay. So um, I want to start off. First of all, thank you all for coming um, and being here. I know it's hard. It's Thursday, whether it's afternoon or evening. Um, it's a hard time, you know, for people on Thursday. We're preparing for Shabbat. We're getting, you know, we're still in the midst of like finishing after the Chagim. <laughs> Um, so, um, I appreciate you being here and, um, I really wanted to give this year today because I felt that, um, some people missed it. They wanted to hear it from the group that I'm in and, um, they weren't able to come live and, um, I see people in the States also, I'm going to be starting also a series of Shurim Bezrat Hashem, um, and Tefillah and Muna. Everyone asked me, you're going to speak about Geula? <laughs> So, uh, of course, I always speak about Geula. We are, we are doulas for Geula, as my good friend Devara coined that term. And uh, we, you know, thank you for putting on your camera. Everybody can put on their camera. That would be great. I'd love to see you guys. No pressure. You know, everybody has their own, you know, you're busy with something. It's fun, I understand. But I always love to see faces. Um, so, um you know, we, you know, we're, we're really here to bring about the Yeshua, Bezat Hashem for Am Yisrael. And uh, we have that koach. So we have to realize that it's a tremendous, tremendous koach. And um, every time we learn together, we do mitzvahs together, we daven together, we bring about tremendous, tremendous um, kochot and positive energies to the world. You know, as you're cooking, as you're making your challah, I think somebody here, Tavor, you're making challah. <laughs> Hi. Um, and um, as you're busy preparing for Shabbat, just have in mind, you know, that you're doing Avodat Hashem. And everything that we do is for our families to have a, to have our own Mikdash Me'at of a beautiful, you know, our own little Mikdash Me'at, our holy sanctuary. And to be able to Mikdash our, our homes you know, for the sake of um, our families and for Am Yisrael, everything that we do, just to have the right kavana when you do it, you know, have an intention, place your intention in the right way. And Bezat uh, Hashem, it should bring health, it should bring Yeshuot, it should bring Besarot Tavot to your home, to your families, and to all of Am Yisrael, Bezat Hashem. So it's a beautiful time to give a shir because it's Erev Shabbat. It's, for, it's right after Rosh Chodesh. We just celebrated two days of Chodesh Cheshvan. I want to dedicate, it's also tonight, a very special time. It is the Hilula, the ninth Hilula, the ninth yard side of Rav Ovadia Yosef, Zecher Tzadik Nivracha. I just ran back. <laughs> the reason why I scheduled this so late is because I, I really wanted to be there. And I wasn't sure I'd be able to get there tomorrow. So I ran back. I just came back from his caver, and I was Zoche Baruch Hashem to daven there for you, for all of Am Yisrael, for our families. So this should be, this shiur should be Le'ilui Nishmat, Rabbi Vadi Yosef Ben Gorgia, Tehen Nishmato Be'Gan Eden Surah B'Tzor Chaim. He should be a Melitziosha for all of us. Should bring us the Geula, Geula Akrova, and Yeshuot for Am Yisrael, and B'Sorot Tovot for all of us. And uh, the Beit Mikdash from Hera Be'amenu, Mashiach Tzitkenu Berachamim Rabim. This shiur also, Lavdir Shabir Rafua. Actually, I wanted to say one more, Leiluni Shmat. Chanita, can you tell me? I, I had it written down, I can't find my paper. Tell me your, your daughter's name, Leiluni Shmat. Can you unmute? Are you by the phone? Chanita? When you get a chance, if you can either write it in the chat or unmute so we could say Luni Shmat, your daughter. I don't have the paper in front of me. Um, and it was, uh, this week was uh, Hanita's daughter, granddaughter's wedding. And she should have Mazal Tov. Sarit Rachel Bat Yitzchak David. Good. Luni Shmat Sarit Rachel Ben Yitzchak David. Bat, Bat Yitzchak David. Luni Shmat Sarit Rachel. Bat Yitzchak Bat Yitzchak David. Thank you. Began Eden, and she, Zat Hashem, you should only see smachot. She, she Amen. Means, Amen. Of your whole family on the special occasion Amen. of your granddaughter's wedding. Yeah. She should, uh, have Amen. 
issue out. Did you want to ask me something? Uh, yeah, Dina Bryna, but the read Rachel, that's the Kala, and the Chasen is Chaim Yitzchak Ben Bracha. Bezrat Hashem, they should have Yeshuot, Bezrat Hashem, Mazal Tov, Smachot Bezrat Hashem, and should also be Refuach Shema for your husband. For your husband? Amen. Yitzchak David Ben Shalata. Refuach Shema Yitzchak David Ben Shalata. And uh, for everybody here and for their children, Hashem should hear our tefillot, and this should be a powerful night of, of positive energies and and Hashem Yeshuot for Am Yisrael. Um, also, Naomi Orli Batalis Adiza Bezrat Hashem, Nikola Yeshuot, Vuga Guna Tzlacha Bezrat Hashem. Um, I want to start off saying Chodesh Tov to everyone. It's Chodesh Cheshvan. For some of you, it's a review. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I guess you wanted to come on and hear it again. Um, and for some, uh, maybe we'll add some things. But we actually said, we started with Rav Avadis. If I want to start actually with a, a story of Rav Avadis, so I don't forget because I just heard it. I was on the way. And, um, you know, we were, I was there and it was just incredible to just be there at the Kever, with so many hundreds and hundreds of people are coming. And, you know, it's nine years and, you know, but he was such a, he was an Abba, you know, he was Abba Le Kulam. He was a father. We feel like we lost our father. And, um, you know, just people standing there and, you know, dividing to Helim and giving out food. And it was just, it's so beautiful, you know, like Mika Amcha Yisrael. And he was so special because he related to us. He related to us in in, in a, a very special way, even though he, you know, he was a big tzaddik. I mean, he, he wrote so many sfarim and so many piskiyal achot, but he was able to relate to the am. He was able to re, just really relate to each one, and we each felt that love and that connection. And, you know, that's what it means when we learn Torah or we're, we're teaching Torah. We have a tremendous koach, but... It has to be relatable. It has to be something that's relatable. And that's what he was. He was somebody who was just brought it down. And he, he wrote so many svarim that people can just learn. They can open up a sefer and learn. And he was able to build up the atara, you know, to build up the Spartic um, Torah community here. And they were saying how there were thousands of people today that, you know, want to be part of this. They want to hear. They want to hear about him. And they, there's so many yeshivot that opened up in Kolalim. And it's just amazing. And just goes to show the koch of one person and what one person can do. I'll tell you a story that he was, you know, he was very, very sick and he was supposed to have a meeting with one of the people in the government. They wanted to request that there should be, I can't remember the number now, it was 441 um, uh, classes, Torah class they wanted to open up. It should be available to open up, so 441 classes to open up. And, um, he said uh, he has to go. He was very, very sick. He was coughing. He had fever, maybe. And uh, Rav Derry was mentioning that he uh, he told him, you have to go to the hospital. We can't go. He said, no, no, no. This is for the sake of Torah. We have to go. We have to go. And he went. And uh, the person in the cabinet you know, said to him, Maran, <laughs> like, what are you doing here? You look very ill. He says, la, la, la. He said, you have to, he says to Derry, he says, take him to the hospital. He take him to the doctor. And he said, no, I told him not to. I told him I want to come. This is more important. It's for the sake of Torah. He says, what's so important? He says, I want to be able to have 441 classes open up for the, you know, for the Torah community, for the Sephardic community. And he says, okay, we'll do it. And he says, but you have to go to the hospital. <laughs> he says, okay, now I'll go. And he took him, it happens to be that you have to stay in the hospital for a few weeks. He happened, he had pneumonia. He had pneumonia. It wasn't just some sick. He was very, very sick. But look what he did, Mesirut Nefesh. So when he when he told him he's gonna open up these classes, he said, I think it's a gematria, Titen Emet Yaakov. Right? Titen Emet Yaakov, the Torah Israel. And he said to him, That's the gematria, and you should and she benched him, he blessed him, you know, that he should be Matliach. And um, really, we see that he dedicated so many times, even at the end of his life, that he was so, so sick, but he 
wanted to be there for the cloud. He wanted to be there for the cloud till the last minute. I mean, there was even a story, I think, of he was writing a get for an, uh, an aguna, and he didn't want to stop. He was sick. It says that he was like almost passing out, but he didn't want to stop. He had to finish. And when he finished writing the get, um, you know, the heter, maybe the heter for the get, then he said, okay, now I'll go to the hospital. But he knew that he had a mission. He had an avoda. And he dedicated himself to that avoda, and he he loved all of clients. Well, we know there were so many agunot that he was matir, women who you know could not get a get for a long time. Thought the shem this should be a schut for them also tonight, that they should find their Yeshua, as Lat Hashem, and be able to get their gets and be able to be free. So t- we said it's a very special time this month. This is the month of Cheshvan. We're coming right after the Chagim. We have so much excitement. There was so much you know dancing and singing and. There's so many, you know, so much positive energy. And it was so hard to like start the week, no? Like piles of laundry and the houses of Balagan. But we're entering into the, it's a very special time. It's it's Cheshvan. And during this time, um, we have what's called, well, I'm going to talk about a little bit Cheshvan and the significance of it. Even though this month is called Cheshvan, it really, it's given another name. It's given the name Mar Cheshvan. And Mar means bitter. So why are you saying this month is bitter? Like, what are you calling a month bitter? The truth is that the name was given that name together. It was called Mar Cheshvan, apparently, in um, in the Sfarim. And really, it doesn't mean bitter there. It just is the name that was given. I forgot how it, it, it translated the word Cheshvan. But why are we calling it Mar? That's really the name. So why are we calling it that? So the reason we're calling it that because... This month doesn't have any Chagim. We just came off like so many Chagim. And, you know, and we're we're on such a high. And this month doesn't have any Chagim. It was Ma. It's Ma. It doesn't have, it has actually a Rechel in the yard size. But, you know, I heard a beautiful thing that we could change the Ma to Ram. The word Ma is Mem Resh. We shift it, we turn it around, and it's Ram. Ram means to uplift. So, Bezrat Hashem, with this month, we should be able to uplift the month and make it positive, not bitter. How? With our words, with the cost of our lashon, with the power of our tefillah. This month is a month for davening. This month is also called the month of bul. It's mentioned in the Torah, the month of bul. Why bul? Because the mabul happened during this month. It began in this month and it ended in this month. And mabul is synonymous with water. Water is synonymous with shefa, with bracha. This is the month of it's mesugal for panasa, daven for panasa. It's mesugal for shiduchin. It's mesugal for shalom bayit. Bezrat Hashem, we should be zochet to all these things. What happened during this month? We're told that this month the the mishkan was completed, and really should have been inaugurated. But Hashem waited to inaugurate it the following year on Tishrei. So Cheshvan was like a little embarrassed, like. Took away something that's such a big schut from this month. So Hashem said, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to reward this month that during this month will be the third Bet HaMikdash. That the third Bet HaMikdash will be inaugurated in this month. So this is the month of Geula, ladies. I told you to talk about it. This is the month that we have to connect to the personal Yeshua. We have to ask for personal Geula in our personal lives, anything that we need in Panasa and Shiduchim and in Shalom Bayit, in Chinuch Yeladim, but we also have to daven for Am Yisrael to be able to have their Yeshua and Geula, that we should all be able to merit to the, the true Geula, the true Bet HaMikdash, the Bet, third Bet HaMikdash being rebuilt. And just to show you, it says that the month um, of Tishrei, Cheshvan, and Kislev are the months related to Ephraim, Menashe, and Benjamin. Those are like the three the Galim also that were together. The Seder of the Galim, they were together, the, the way the, the Shvatim encamped. So um, these were the three children we know. Ephraim Menashe is Yosef, and Benjamin is, these are the children of Rachel. And we know in this month, Rachel Imenu, Yud Aleph Cheshvan is the yard side of Rachel Imenu. And we, you know, we are what Maram is to that. In these three months, Tishrei, Cheshvan, and Kislev are a remiss to that, that Bnei Rachel. And who is Rachel? Rachel was called the Akeret Abayit. She was the Ikar. She was the mainstay of the home because she was supposed to marry Noyakov first. 
So if you look at the words akeret, it's also synonymous of akrav, which is the the sign, the you know the the what do you call it? the Scorpio is the sign of this month, akrav, and the akrav we're told the gematria is the letters David Mashiach. It's the same numerical value as David Mashiach, which is to say that this month is the tikkun. It's a tikkun for all those in Bnei Yisrael who didn't want Mashiach, who didn't want David HaMelech to rule. It's a tikkun in this month to accept the kingship of David, which is Mashiach, Mashiach ben David. And will be Zoha Bezrat Hashem to have Mashiach ben David during this month. It's a beautiful perush, a beautiful understanding. So we see that a keret, like we said, a keret bait is the letters akrav. So it's synonymous with Rachel also. And this is what we are, you know, we're talking about that this koch of Rachel Imenu, what was the koch of Rachel Imenu? Who was she? A koch of Tfila. Really, Rachel, what happened? She was Zoha you know, to to marry, she had to marry Yaakov, but she saw her sister who cried, right? And cried and cried and cried. And she said, I can't. And she gave over her sign, the signs to, to Leah. And we know that Leah then for had children first and Rachel only later. So it's interesting in relation to this week's parasha, we're told Vayizkol, Vayizkol lokim et Rachel, Vayizkol shem et Noach. It says that Hashem remembered or he mentioned, he remembers Rachel and he remembered Noach. What's the connection of the Vayiskol to Rachel between Rachel and Noach? It says that Rachel said, I was like Noach, right? Everything was planned. Everything was okay. Everything was destined to be good, right? I was supposed to marry Yaakov and I didn't cry. I didn't complain. And I saw my, my sister's plight. And I gave over the science to my sister. And who's Leah? Leah was the one who crying. She has to marry Asa. She's destined to marry Asa. So she said, says that Rachel was not, she said, in a way she was like complacent, right? In a way she was like complacent. Hashem tells us that when did she cry, right? We know that when it came to Rachel, where was she buried? She was buried on the outskirts of Israel. She wasn't buried in Mount Zemachpila. And the Navi tells us that Rachel cried for Kla Yisrael. So always, you know, that they're on the border. Whenever they leave, they should be able to come back. And we know that Rachel won't besiege Tashan. And she was crying and crying and crying. And we, we're told, the Navi tells us, Rachel, mini kolech mi bechi ve'enayich mi dima. Stop crying. Ki yesh sachar lepulatech. Hashem says there's a reward for what you did. The schar that she got for what she did to give up on being the akeret abayit. She was the mainstay. She was supposed to be the first wife. She was supposed to be the one having, you know, the children first. And yet she gave up that main role and gave it over to Le'ah. And so we learned that by Yisqol, Hashem remembered Rachel. He didn't forget her act. Tremendous, tremendous act of a mesirut nefesh. I would love, ladies, if you could turn on your cameras. Love to see you. You know, I see uh, Randy has her camera on. Love to see you guys if you are able to turn on your cameras. Um, so, tremendous act of Mesirut Nefesh. This is Rachel. And it says that the greatest enemy, though, of prayer, really, is when we're complacent, when we're a little too comfortable, when things are just going great. We don't always remember Hashem. We don't always, you know, we don't always think about, oh, thank you, Hashem, for, you know, Okay, maybe parking spot like in Brooklyn, you would thank Hashem because it's not the norm. <laughs> but here, you know, you park, you don't think about it. There's plenty of parking here, Baruch Hashem and Eretz But like certain things, you just like, you don't think about it, you know, and things just become so easy, right? And the problem with Noah, he was a big tzaddik, ish tzaddik ayabed al-tab. But Hashem said to him, go and build the teva. Before he tells him, go and build the teva, what do you tell him? I'm going to bring destruction to the world. I'm going to be destruction. If they don't do tshuva, this is it. I'm going to bring them a booth. So go and build a teva. So you only listen to the last part. Like, hello, what happened to the beginning part? What happened to, you know, helping others? He forgot in a sense that part. And that's what we're told. Tzadik 
had he lived in another generation like Avram, who all he did was chesed and spreading Hashem, the word of Hashem, right? He would not have been called a tzaddik. And so he was a little bit too much, you know, too comfortable, so to speak. And he only ended up taking care of his his family. Um, so we have to realize that sometimes we're, we're complacent. We don't pray in the same way. But in this, you know, we're told from here that we have to cry. We have to pray. We have to pray with all our heart. We have to pray with all our koach, with all our, all our energy. And we really have to ask Hashem to bring us the Yeshua. Pray for others. Pray for somebody who needs a shiduch. If you can't help them with a shiduch, at least pray for them. You know, we have to utilize the koach of tefillah. And we as women have this tremendous, tremendous koach. And we see how Rachel cried and cried and cried. And yesh sachal apuratech. You're going to see the schar. You're going to see the reward of all that crying. A person that I was telling the ladies that um, we were a few older singles went to see a big tzaddik. I'm sure you've heard of a tzaddik in our time, of Arya Levine. Went to see his uh, his, his son, Rav Rafael Levine. Actually in the same cemetery as uh, Rav Vadia in Sanhedria in Eretz Israel. So he um, we went to him and he said, can we get a bracha? You know, we want a bracha for a shidduch. So um, he told us, what does that mean? Davin, ask Hashem, Kavel Hashem, Chazak Becha, strengthen your heart, Vikavel Hashem. Why are you repeating it? What, what's the purpose of repeating it? And what is the purpose? That sometimes you don't get answered. And you don't get answered. And you Davin, you Davin, you Davin. Women who are trying to have children, women who are looking for the Zivug. You just, it's hard. It's hard. And that's what he was telling us. And we were saying to him, like, okay, can you give us a bracha? <laughs> like, what's the bracha? So he explained to us, sometimes it's hard. And you don't want to daven anymore. Chazak becha. Strengthen your heart and daven again. Because we don't know which tefillah is going to open that door. We don't know which tefillah is going to help us to be able to reach the point where Hashem opens the Sharei Shemaim and brings us the Yeshua. And we should never lose hope because a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves each and every one of us. We're very special to Kadosh Baruch Hu. But sometimes we feel this, you know, this gloominess, right? We all have times that we go through, especially now after the Chagim, after the excitement, all the kids were home. Yeah, it was Balagan and, you know, but now things dying down, you go back to routine and it's sort of like, you know, and you look outside, it's getting gray. Now it's gonna, the day's gonna get shorter. So it's darker earlier. So we're told, you know, like in this darkness, really a person can go into a depression. You can go, you know, sometimes it's like, it's hard. It's hard when things are dark and not only outside, also inside. It's hard to have that, you know, that energy, that excitement, that, you know, desire even to open up the Sidhu and Daven or to talk to Hashem. So we're told, according to Rabbeinu Tam, in the Sefer HaYashar, that every galut is mechayev, brings about a geula. Every galut brings about a geula. And these, these are called yemei ahava and yemei hasina. That really, what does a person do? A person tries to grow. He works on himself. And sometimes he reaches a plateau and he seems like nothing's happening. There's nothing happening. I can't, there's, I don't see where's the issue coming from. Why, how's it going to happen? I don't understand. How is it happening? So he reaches this plateau and it seems like he's not growing. Just like a seed. Somebody was mentioning in the shield. Just like a seed. You know, you plant the seed in the ground. It's dark in there. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't see anything. Come out new. You tell a kid, look, we're going to plant the seed. And he's like waiting one week, two weeks. Like what's happening? But we know there's a process. There's a process that this seed has to go through. It has to rot. And then slowly, slowly, as you water it and you give it sun, you give it that energy that it needs, slowly you see something sprouting, right? So that time of the stagnation, what seems like non-growth is not non-growth. It almost even feels like death. Right? It looks like nothing's growing. There's no plant. What are you talking about? And what are we told? We're told that that is the time that the seed is starting its leda, its birth. The birth is starting. 
So really, when a person is in a stagnant place, really, that's going to be leading the person to his Yeshua. And I remember when I was going through difficult times in my life and I spoke to some people and they said to me, you know, don't dwell on this. This is the time that's going to bring you to a different, you're going to see light after this. You're going to see, you're going to see Yeshua. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, come on, you know, like, I don't see anything. What's happening? You know, like, I just like, this is not working for me. And that's not working for me. And this job and that person and the shit us and the this and the kids. And like, there's so many things like, it's so bleak. It's so dark. What are you talking about? How am I going to see light? And then all of a sudden there's an opening. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? And, and Hashem tells us that, there's a tremendous time when a person's feeling this stagnation to daven and call out and scream out to Hashem. And this is what relates to women. We women are like the Chodesh. The Chodesh, how do we, how do they uh, identify the month? How do they know what's the next month? They didn't have a calendar in the you know olden days, the time of the Torah. Before they set up the calendar, they say from all of the Rebs of Chabad. Yeah. How do we, please stay muted, ladies. How do we, how do they identify the new, the new month? By the new moon, right? They would go out, they would testify, they would witness um, the new moon, and they would, you know, they would be machriz, they would declare it as a new month. They would tell everyone that this is the new month. And that's how they knew. Now, what happens? There's a certain time before the new month starts, that is no moon, right? It's almost, it almost looks like there's a no moon. It waxes and it wanes. This looks like there's nothing, right? And what happens? Slowly, slowly, the moon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And it's unbelievable. In the middle of the month, all of a sudden you see a, a full moon. That's what you know it's the middle of the month, right? So this is the cloth of women. We are also in relation to the moon. We have our cycle of the month, right? The time of ovulation, the time of birth, time of renewal, and a time that looks like almost like Chalila, like there's no life force, right? Just like Leda, when a woman gives birth, excuse me, she goes through a process. If you look into a room and you see her, and you wouldn't know that what birth looks like, right? This woman's screaming, she's in pain contractions everyone's tending to her what does that look like it looks like almost like death like almost like what's going on here something's like wrong here you know and all of a sudden you're screaming and crying and all of a sudden boom 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 and you see birth right that is the koach of geula what do we have to go through in order to get that geula there's a certain time like we said of reaching that plateau and that time we have to have savlanut, savlanut la seven. We have to be able to have the energy to withstand, the patience to withstand the difficult, the challenge, the pain that we're going through. And call out and scream out to Hashem and tefillah and be able to say to Hashem, Hashem, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand what you want from me. But please, Akash Baruch Hu, just, you know, help me out here, you know, and I, I can't do this on my own. And all of a sudden, from that stagnation and from that time of what's called Hamtana, where we wait, the period of waiting, the period of holding back, then there's the Geula, then comes the Yeshua. And that's, what, ladies, if you often look at your life and things that happen, you know, at the times that seem so bleak and so dark, Really, really, Bo Hashem, all of a sudden, it came from nowhere, right? So I say, Yeshua Hashem, Keherafine. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying sometimes it's not a short, you know, period of time. It could be a long period of time. Everybody has their, you know, level of patience <laughs> that they, they have. But really, Akadosh Baruch Hu is saying that we have that ability. If I gave you this Nisayon, um, you're going to be able to handle this. So what is this Hamtana? We learn from this also the power of Ipuk, of holding back. So before I talk about holding back, I'll talk about Bereshit. In Sefer Bereshit, we're told, well, that all the creations, right? That all the things Hashem created in the world. 
when Shem created everything, he put everything in its place. The waters wanted to be spread all over the place. And Hashem said, nope, here's your place, right? The sky, here's your place. Everything had its place. Everything has a time and a place, okay? And so Hashem, what does that mean? Hashem created certain boundaries, right? Certain borders that everything had to be within those boundaries. Otherwise, the world couldn't exist. We see what happened this week in the Parasha. What happened when the water went all over the place? Destruction, right? Mabul. So water had to be contained. Hashem put it in a certain place. Hashem, you know, placed the land over the water. He contained it. It was like, the, you know, there's a, there's a place until the water goes through. And we know what happens in tsunami and the water goes past that place is destruction. So there are certain boundaries. And the same thing in mitzvot, the same thing in the Torah. You know, people will say, like, you have kids that say, like, why can't I do this? Like on Shabbat, like, why can't I just, like, you know, put on the light? Like, what's the big deal? You know, somebody's about you, but they don't know. All the th- so many things you can't do on Shabbat. How do you want me to enjoy Shabbat? Oh, next Shabbat. You want me to enjoy Shabbat? And we can look at our life like that. You know, sometimes our mitzvot, they're heavy. It's like, you know, there's, there's a song. I remember Yehuda um, saying this song. Um, um, higher and higher, it's called. You heard of it? Um, basically, it's the, there's a mashal of a bird and a baby bird that's born. And he wants to fly. He starts, you know, just to come out and walks a little bit. And he, he can't fly. He doesn't know how to fly. And he tells him, like, what are all these heavy things on my on the sides of me? I don't understand. What are these weights? Why does Shem give me these weights? It's so much heaviness, you know, such a burden. And the mom said, that, those are your wings. Just flap your wings. And you can fly higher and higher. And then the bird flaps its wings and it goes higher and higher. It's a beautiful mashat. And so too, our mitzvot, they seem like a burden. It seems like it's heavy. It seems like I'm not able to hold on to this. Hashem, it's too much. But Hashem gives us these mitzvot to give us, like, like everything is also within time. Like, I have to do some mitzvot. Certain mitzvot I can only do in certain time, right? Of course, women are not bound by certain time bound mitzvot. But certain, certain mitzvot, like Shabbat a Shabbat. You know what I'm saying? Like, Shabbat comes whether you like it or not. Got to get ready. But, you know, certain things that we just, restrictions, kashrut and everything. But these are boundaries to keep us sort of in line. And we're bound by certain times. We're bound by certain things. Hashem wants us to have certain boundaries so that we should be able to fulfill the mitzvah. We should be able to do the mitzvah to realize that Hashem loves us. If it wouldn't be for that boundary, then we wouldn't have the, you know, we wouldn't have the path to go on. Because sometimes when things are too free, too open, we know with kids, you know, you don't have any boundaries. They just, you know, take advantage. So, you know, we we say that we want HaKadosh Baruch Hu to, you know, to help us, to guide us with those boundaries. So we need the boundaries. And we tell kids, you need boundaries, you know, sorry. <laughs> we have to tell it to ourselves also. But we're told actually in Bereshit that there are certain times that maybe we can cross the boundary, right? There's et ratzon, that sometimes Hashem tells us we can overcome, we can go past whatever that is, that boundary is. And there's an etratzon that we have to maybe stretch ourselves a little more. So I want to talk about Gan Eden. In Gan Eden, um, this is the Ben Ishchai brings us down, that there were four Nehalot, there were four rivers that flowed through Gan Eden. And these rivers, I want to talk about their names, and they represent to us um the ability to grow in a certain way to go past the boundaries in a certain way so the, the four rivers are pishon gichon chidekel and herat and these are the four now that flowed through gan eden now we know Adam and Chava lived in Ganeid, and we see again, they have certain boundaries. You can have from everything, you can enjoy from everything, but from the one tree, Esadat, Tovera, you were not allowed to touch, not even to eat, to touch. And guess what they did, right? This is the Koch of the Yetzirah, you know, that can just take us over. 
They had everything. Everything was pleasant. Everything was nice. Well, you know, those are the boundaries. Hashem set certain boundaries. So here we're told that these were special navot that flowed. And we need to say to ourselves, based on these knowledge that I talk about, each one of them, I've done so much, but Hashem, I want to be able to flow like the Nawot. What do I mean? Let's talk about it. So Pishon is like Lifshot. Lifshot is to fret, spread out, right? Pasha is the Sharish. It also means to add or to grow. And what do we need to do? Sometimes we do Chesed. We do kindness for someone. You know, we show, we show somebody, uh, you know, that we care about them. And we're like, okay, I did my best. I tried, I did it, you know, okay, I'm done, <laughs> you know. But sometimes we need to think, can I do a little more? Is there somebody else maybe I can reach out to? Is there somebody else I can call? Is there something else that I can do? Even in our own home, chesed begins at home, right? And sometimes we think, okay, you know, I did my duties. I cooked supper. I did the laundry. I'm done. You know, but sometimes one kid might need a little bit more heart to heart. You know, maybe our husbands need a little bit more time and, you know, they want to talk more. We don't have the patience always, you know, whatever it is. Can you stretch a little more? Can you do a little more like the Pishon? Stretch yourself, do a little more, a little more chesed, whether it's at home or outside the home. So that's going beyond the boundaries sometimes, right? There are boundaries. And we shouldn't do extra chesed if we can't take care of our home. We have to do what's good in our home first. But we also can stretch ourselves sometimes. We all have to know ourselves. We have to really judge ourselves accordingly. Um, the second one is gichon. Gichon comes from the shon gachon. Gachon is the throat, right? It's like the part of the reptile that's on the ground. And what's the throat synonymous with? Our speech, right? The ability to, to speak. And the thing that we do most besides speaking is davening, right? Three times a day, we're davening. Can, sometimes you feel like, like we said before, you know, sky is gloomy and gray. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm done. Like, I can't, I can't daven for that anymore. How much more can I daven? But Hashem says, one more tefillah. One more tefillah. Don't give up. You know, stretch yourself. A little more. Daven a little more. And there's like Hashem. The Yeshua is going to come. And the same thing could be also in our speech and the way in the way we speak, you know, maybe we have to stretch ourselves to say something, or maybe we have to hold back, which is what we said before, the power of holding back, ipuk, it's tremendous koach. So when a person holds back and doesn't say what he wants to say, really, and that's going to maybe hurt somebody else's feelings, or he's, you know, feeling a little bit like, you know, oh, I can't, like, I have to tell her how I feel. Let's say that lush and hara, you know, like, no. Hold yourself back because you don't know how it's going to affect that person. You don't know what's going to happen in the ramifications of you saying that. You have to be careful. Be so careful and be able to, you know, to utilize your speech in, the, in that way. But let's say it in the positive. That sometimes we can say even another positive word. We say so much negativity and criticism. Maybe we have to say another positive word to that child, to that friend, you know, that we, we don't maybe say enough. So we could take it that way and go beyond. Chideka. Chideka comes from two words to um, the Shorish, right? It's chad and kal. And chad is like sharp and smooth, and kal is light, right? Light and easy. So this is related to the way we act when sometimes, you know, somebody does us a wrong, you know, wrongdoing. Somebody hurts us. And somebody said something, you know, that wasn't in place, or, you know, they hurt our feelings in some way. Sometimes we have to just let it go. Let it be. The chadut uvekalut. Smooth and easy. Let it go. Forgive. Don't hold on. Don't, you know, build on it. Give that person another opportunity. And try to make shalom for the sake of shalom. You know? Instead of, I'm so this, I'm so hurt, I'm so that. Just sort of like reflect the light out. It's not just about you. Maybe she had a bad day. Maybe she, you know, fought with her husband. Maybe she, her, you know, her kids are driving her crazy. So she didn't say things in the right way. You know, we don't know. And we have to sometimes, you know, not be judgmental and be able to just be smooth and easy and just let it go. And this again, in our homes as well, 
with our spouses, with our kids, you know, things happen and it gets very, you know, sometimes sticky. Sometimes it's better not to say anything and just, you know, go out of the room, take a deep breath, count to 10, you know, try to imagine something positive and let it go. And um, the last one is Plat, which is relation to Peru. So this is Albany Mima. She talks about this and she says, this is children. Peru revu should be fruitful and multiply, right? She says, so bring one more child. Okay, you have a lot of kids, but yiladim is a bracha. Children are a bracha. Now, sometimes you're not at the age of being able to have more children. Maybe give more time to your children. Nurture your children more. Or if you have grandchildren, nurture them a little more. Give them more time. You know, maybe spend the one-on-one -on -one time with, you know, with that child or that grandchild. And for people who don't have kids, how does that relate to them? You know, that there are so many Rabbanim. I can think of it. One of them is Rabbi Shokovsky from Neve Yerushalayim and his wife. She's called Bambi. She's famous midwife here in our Israel. They have no children, but yet they have thousands of children. From the Torah that they taught, Rabbi Shakovsky, he taught so many women in Neve Yerushalayim and they're so close to him. And from, you know, Bambi, the midwife, there are so many children that she gave, helped to give birth to. So, you know, it's incredible. Like, really, Banecha, Talmidecha, Elu Banecha. Your Talmidim. So if you don't have children, you can teach Torah and you can spread Torah and maybe you can nurture other people's kids. And I, you know, I was also thinking about the Klosenberger Rebbe who lost all of his kids and his family, but yet he built an empire. You know, the Klosenberger Yeshiva, the Sons of Rev today and all the, the community, and Baruch Hashem, a person can think, oh, I have nothing, you know, and just give up. No, you know, that doesn't mean that you should give up. You don't know what, how you can rebuild. And we actually learned this from Chava, that, that uh, you know, Chava, after, you know, being in Gan Eden and being thrown out of Gan Eden, they, they, she could have given up. But yet, instead, she had this, you know, koach of starting again. And this is the power of women. This is the koach of the month that we said, because Chava then had another child, and she said, Ki shakli elokim zerachel. Hashem provided for me with another child. She continued to have children. She continued to rebuild. And so we have to also renew our relationships, um, rebuild again, maybe renew our relationship with our friends, maybe renew, make shalom, you know, and also to do it with simcha. It's so important that sometimes when you do something, to infuse in a simcha, like when you put simcha into something, there's a tremendous, tremendous koach. You know, in Orchlet Sadikim, there's no chapter that talks about um, bitachon. Like a lot of different midot that are mentioned. It doesn't mention the midot of bitachon. Bitachon is trust in Hashem. But where is it mention it? In the Shar of Simcha. In the Shar of Simcha, it mentions bitachon. Because Simcha, joy, brings you bibotach by Hashem. So when you're b'simcha, what are you showing? You're infusing your house with bitachon by Hashem. Because you're understanding and recognizing that everything is for the good. So we spoke about borders, we spoke about boundaries, and everybody needs boundaries and borders, and it's really a bracha to have it, right? And, you know, it's so important to have it, and we need them in order to have rich, healthy lives. But sometimes stretching ourselves beyond, whether it's one more chesed, one more tefillah, you know, making, letting it go, just having shalom, giving to our children, and just letting you yourself flow like a naha, like a river, right? Like a fountain, free, unrestricted. So sometimes it's time for ipuk, holding back, and then sometimes it's time to just let it flow, let it go, and just allow ourselves. And you know what, also with ourselves, sometimes we're so, you know, um, critical of ourselves, and we think so negatively of ourselves, and sometimes you have to learn to let it go. I was just in an amazing class with Rabbi Rachamim Biton, and we learned the skill of letting it be and letting it go. And it's something we need to work on because we hold on to so many things. It becomes like such a heavy burden instead of feeling it as a mitzvah, as a chesed, as an opportunity to grow, we end up feeling like it's too much because we hold on to so many things and we don't let them go. And it's something we all need to work on. So we have the boundaries, we have structure, but it, which gives us clarity, but we also need to expand ourselves. We also need to you know, stretch ourselves and we need to try to let it go. Yeah, like a river.
because these we're talking about the four rivers. Um, and you know, in in this um, in Gan Eden, what happened was when they were exiled from Gan Eden, we know that they were starting klalot, and the uh, dam had the klala of You gotta sweat for your money, you know. You gotta work hard. And that a man till today, you know, he's working hard. He's responsible for the Palestine. In some homes, I know it's the ladies also, or only the ladies, maybe, because the men are learning. But that is the kala for the man. And the woman um, was child rearing, right? The tzal gidul banim, and, you know, the difficulty in childbirth and all that. So what happens sometimes, we get bogged down by this, because we live with this. And it's a certain... Um, type, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain, you know, a certain type of um, a feeling like you're like, ugh, you know, like, again, all you're talking about is panasa, you know, your business, and she, and the husband's like, all you talk about is the kids and what they did today and what they didn't do today and they didn't listen to you, you know, and so really that's a clara, the clara is that you're going to be so bogged down by your, you know, what your problem or your issue is that you're sort of going to forget the other person. So what's beautiful is instead, take that. And instead of saying, you know, oh, I'm so annoyed by you, daven for him, daven for your husband, that he should be able to have fun, that it shouldn't be an odd. And that husband should daven for his wife, that, you know, that she should have an easier time with the child rearing. Of course, it's not only her responsibility and he should listen to her, of course. But um, it's a nice thing to, instead of, you know, telling him off, utilize that opportunity and try to dive in for him. And how do we, um, how do we hold on to this newness that we were talking about? We're talking about Chodesh Cheshvan, it's the beginning, it's the beginning of the Chodesh is always a time of newness. How do we hold on to that, you know, in our lives, especially in our homes and our marriages, like they live in Gan Eden, you know, when things were just like smooth and easy. So we're told in the word Bereshit, there's so many different combinations of words in the word Bereshit. You know, the Rashi brings Bishvil Reshit, or Reshit, for the first ones, for Klai, so Hashem gave us the Torah. But if you look at the words Bereshit, you have two words, Rosh and Bait. Rosh is the head and Bait is the home. And what is that talking about? This is the woman's role. She is the Rosh and Bait. And you sometimes may think that's an Ol, but it's not, it's a Bracha. You have the ability to be the akeret habayit. You have the ability to be the essence of the home, the ikav. And whatever you do and how you infuse your home with the, with the simcha, not with the complaints, with, you know, putting on music and singing and dancing. And that's the energy that's going to be flowing through your home. And if you're, not married, if you're not married yet, you could also do that. Through the simcha of, you know, how you conduct yourself around others and in your home. Bezat Hashem, you'll be zafet to your Yeshua and find your zivug, Bezat Hashem. You know, so this is what we're talking about is also in relation to not only married people, every person, but as women, to approach our lives with chuka, with a desire, with really enthusiasm, you know, and it's not easy because, you know, everybody has their days, you know. Um, so like they say, like, I, you know, what was today? It's a bad hair day. You know, they say that the teenagers, <laughs> so, you know, you could have your day, you know, like it's just, it's been a day, right? So really we have to work on this and, and sometimes it means putting on the music. Sometimes it means shifting and just doing something else that brings you good, positive vibes, eating a piece of chocolate. It's okay. Having some ice cream. So this chuka comes from the word that. Um, um, in the in the Torah, let me just find the pasuk. Ve'eli shech chukatech. We're told in in uh, Bereshit Peragima and pasuk Tezayin, your craving should be for your husband. Ve'hu yim shalbach, and he should rule over you. So really, this was a klala um, that was given, but here the Bnei Yisachar says that you should be eli shech chukatech ve'hu yim shalbach. You should have the chuka. The chuka is a desire, the passion to approach the mitzvah with excitement, and he will be a mashal. He will take it as a mashal, as an example, right? And here is what we learn: is that when you do something in a positive way, 
and you go into the mitzvah or go into doing something in a positive way, you say positive things, that that's going to infuse that energy in that home and it's going to be sort of uh, contagious, you know, to the ones around you. And um, so really, instead of looking at it as every action she does is under scrutiny, you know, and that it's like a punishment, instead we're, we're reversing it do something with excitement, to do something with shuka. And shuka is different than cheshek. Cheshek is, you know, also a desire uh, to want to do something. Cheshek is a desire to take something, to tackle something new. That's something like a man usually likes to do, you know, to tackle something new. But shuka is drawing newness from the things that are familiar to us, right? Things that are familiar become mundane, you know, mitzvah tarashim oh, I'm doing it again and again but we can infuse it with a certain energy. And it's all in the matter of our perspective and in our mindset. If we put in a positive mindset and we do something the simcha, then we do something with zeal and we start our day with excitement. And if you have the same routine, maybe add something to that routine. Put something in that's going to change it, that will give you that excitement. And to approach everything with shuka. And if you look at the word shuka, it's tash kave. That you look forward to that which which tires you right that's what it means you look forward to that which tires you you approach your chores and tasks with excitement to do it again with shuka that you're tired of listening to another shidduch and another shidduch and when's it going to come already and when am i going to be able to have that home when am i going to be able to have the child when am i going to be able to have that job you know and i'm just i can't do this cooking anymore and the cleaning anymore Right? And you're normal and you're healthy and it's okay. So sometimes we have to infuse our life with a certain chuka. Now we're told as women, tremendous gift that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. We know that the Imahot were blessed with three miracles that happened for them. One miracle was the cloud that was hovering. Could you just play, please stay muted? The cloud that was hovering over the tent the dough that you saw would stay fresh from week to week, and the candle that would never get extinguished from week to week, right? But really, all these three things, the cloud, the, the dough, and the candle, are temporary things because a cloud, the wind could come and blow it away. Dough could become sour, and the candle can get extinguished. You know, so these things are really temporary. So why, why did the Imahot merit these blessings that they you, you know would last from week to week if they're so you know temporary because what because of the power of bitchachut because of the power of the renewal that they infuse in these things the passion approaching every mitzvah with simcha and they infuse life the mundane the repetitive tasks with kedusha with simcha and that's why they merited to have these three special mitzvot um continue for them from week to week. It was really Nisim that happened for them. <clears throat> and really, we look at this week's parasha. What was happening? It says the people were punished for Hamas in parasha Noach. And what is Hamas? Hamas is stealing, right? Robbing, taking something that doesn't belong to you. And you know what we're told? That Hamas is like giving also without joy. Like you're giving and you don't really want to give, you know? And and that's sometimes what we do is that we rob ourselves, we rob our family of what they could be, be receiving. And sometimes with joy, if we don't do something with joy, we're robbing ourselves. We go around with a lousy, you know, attitude, a sad face, a bitter mood. You're really robbing yourself of the schut of that mitzvah. And you're, you're robbing your children and your family from the ability to benefit from you know, from the mitzvot that you could be doing. And you're also robbing the world of the chen that you could be infusing. I remember um, Rebetzin Youngrice would say, somebody asked her, um, Rebetzin, and she always used to smile. She always had a big smile on her face. And she said, Rebetzin, where did your smile begin? Does it begin on the inside or on the outside? You know, it says, but have several planim yafot, right? A person has to always greet people. Mekaba kol apne adam several planim yafot. In and she said to her, you know what? She listened to her question. And she said, what a great question. And she said, Mamala, she said, a smile can never, can, cannot, cannot always be 
We can't always be smiling on the inside. But sometimes, she said, you have to smile on the outside and it'll permeate on the inside. So through our actions, we allow ourselves to feel. So even if you don't feel like it, you sometimes put it on, put on that smile and pretend and there's not the show. You'll hopefully feel better, hopefully. <laughs> Okay, so this is the koach of women. This is the koach of yitchashut. This is the koach of being able to really, you know, connect with, we as women, with the power of, of simcha, of being able to give, being able to start again. I want to tell you a story, and uh, we'll wrap it up. I was listening to um, uh, Sivan Rahav Meir. She is a host um, on a, the on the news here. She's a from uh, newscaster. She actually, I think, lived in the States for a while. She came back during Corona. And um, she has a program where she gives over a little bit about the Parsha, and then she has somebody speak. So last week, she had a man speak. His name is Ephraim Rimmel. And I didn't hear, I didn't recognize the name, but, you know, she spoke about, he spoke about his life. It was really tremendous. I'm going to actually have to look at it because I want to remember what he said exactly. And really, he was a victim of a terror, of um, a very bad uh, accident. And he became paralyzed. He had, he was in a wheelchair. He lost his wife and I think his daughter, if I remember correctly. And his son also was in a coma for a while. For Hashem, he's, uh, you know, better and he's in rehabilitation. But it was a very, very challenging time um, for for him and his family. And um, he spoke about it. And he spoke about, you know, how do you go on? How do you start anew? How do you move on with your life? He still had other kids, um, you know, even while contending with his own disability and issue medically, he lost his wife and his daughter. Yeah, it was his daughter. I'm looking at it. Um, so how do you go on? He says, when I, it happened, he said, I was reminded of something that I um, I heard as a young man. What did he hear? He heard his Rebbe explain to him. He said, you know, um, sometimes a person has a question, right? So the good question is preferable to an answer that's not so good. Right? Not always, like, I guess he was asking him a question and he didn't have the answer. Or didn't, you know, he said to him, a good question is preferable. It sounded better in Hebrew, but anyways, to an answer that's not so good. So at that time, he said, I thought about this. And I thought, you know, probably concerned the question in the Torah class. And really the rabbi was, you know, in other words, if the rabbi asks the question and you can't come up with a good answer, a good enough answer, it's preferable just to live with the question. But the rabbi wasn't only referring to the question. He said the rabbi was referring to life itself, right? That sometimes we have to live with the question. We don't have all the answers. And he says, now for the first time in my life, I have to contend with a question that is more powerful than any answer I can find. He says, I don't know why this accident happened. I don't know why I had to lose my wife and my daughter, why I had to become disabled. He said, we often are accustomed to finding, to looking up questions. You know, we can ask Google, right? We go on search and we look for the answers. We ask Google and we'll receive a multitude of responses. And then we scroll down until we find what we're looking for, right? But in this case, he says, couldn't find the answer. I don't understand, he said, what Hashem has in plan and what Hashem is doing here. And he said this all with a smile, incredible person. He said, I definitely think that I could have writ written the script differently, but I'm not the one in charge. And he said, I had to learn to live and contend with this. And he says, that's when my rehabilitation began. He says, from that moment, I understood that I can never understand only that I knew that I didn't know. And I decided to do the very best that I could with the life that Hashem gave me. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. 
Ephraim Rimmel recently got married and he married a Yelit Coleman. A Yelit Coleman lost her husband, Adiel, in a terrorist attack a couple of years ago, I think it was. He says, whoever wants a second chapter to begin again, he says, he says, you have to want to want. And neither of us, he said, arrived at this chapter, chapter two, because chapter one wasn't good, right? They each had good marriages. He says, we love chapter one very much. Still, we didn't run the world. And nevertheless, we can't allow the big question to thwart us. Both of us lost so much light, and it would be unfortunate if the world also would lose the light that can shine from us alone. So I thought that was tremendous. Gadlut, really gadlut. The koach of renewal, hitchachut, starting again. That sometimes things are cloudy. You know, sometimes I think it's Rev Cook um, that mentions this thought. It sometimes says when the soul when the soul is aglow, even gloomy skies shine with a pleasant light. This is the perush of Rav Kook. That we're beginning in the winter time, right? We're starting, like we said, the days are going to get shorter. Um, you know, when the, st- the skies are going to get grayer, and we have rain. Baruch Hashem, we just got rain in Eretz Yisrael. We just started davening for it, and it's coming. Baruch Hashem. It's, maybe it'll bring us a little sadness, right, during these months, considering these, you know, the long and gray routine, like we mentioned before. But if within us, within us, the soul is a glow, right, Rav Cook, the outside gloom will disappear. And he teaches that we don't need to look outside in order to decide how we're going to feel on the inside. We're meant to experience joy within ourselves. If we look at the reality with a happy, shiny disposition, reality will shine back at us in return. And really, it's something that I think it was asked also of Rabbi Bitton in our course. And we said, you know, we just came from excitement of the Chagim. How do we, how do we not let it, let it go? Like, how do we not lose it? He said, it's not lost. All that excitement and all that Kedusha and that closeness and the love we felt with Hashem is still a part of us. We just have to reconnect to it. And sometimes it means stopping and really trying to just reconnect by meditating, davening, talking to Hashem, stretching ourselves a little more in whatever area, you know, you can, that we mentioned, and taking this koch of itchachut of the new month with us. I give you all a bracha. The Bezlat Hashem should be a chodesh tov and should bring the sorot tovot, yeshuot, nechamot, and uh, a kadosh baruch Hu should answer all the tefillah tova. And we should feel his love. We should feel his warmth. It says, Cheshvan. I saw somebody post it, and I posted it. Chaim smechim v'hamon nisim. Cheshvan. Chaim smechim v'hamon nisim. Which means happy life and a lot of miracles. Bezlat Hashem. And one more thing. It's, we, we start saying, Meshiv ruach umorid ha-geshem. We want Hashem to be Meshiv ruach to blow the wind. And to bring down the the rain. One second, sorry. One second. Mashiva Ruach blows the wind. Ruach is Ruchniyut, Morida Geshem, and Gashmiyut. That we, as Rat Hashem, should be Zoche through connection of the Ruchniyut with the Kaish Baruchu. The tremendous Gashmiyut also. Parnasatuva for everybody. We should be all zochet to have hatzlacha and bracha and everything that we're doing, and Yeshua the sort of for everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. If there's any questions, feel free. You can unmute yourself. I can't believe you're gonna be stopping. How do you do it short? I've never done a short class before. Randy, you're talking to me. Well, sort of. <laughs> How did? How did you stop already? <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to continue? <laughs> yeah. Or whatever. Whatever's good for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to just let you know, ladies, that I'm going to be like Hashem continue giving Shirim weekly. I would like to start a series on Tfilah. 
um, and possibly some other safer also. Um, so look out for my um, shirim that are coming up. And um, I am sure you're on one of my groups if you're here. But if you want to send me a text in case uh, I don't have your information, feel free to send it to me. My phone number, I'll put it in the chat. It's, um, it's going to change soon for my Israeli number, but um, it's plus 1917-679-1711. I put it here in the chat and you can email me also kmillercoaching at gmail.com. Um, I'm also a life coach. If you're interested in life coaching and working with me, I offer also a free um, session to begin with. So it's really amazing and you would benefit from a lot. If you're interested in it, you can reach out to me kmillercoaching at gmail.com. Any questions, ladies? Any, you know, anybody want to share anything? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. Uh, you just inspired me to start a new one. I just finished a picture about, um, you know, at the end of the davening where it has the list of the letters and the names and the pasuks. Yeah. Thinking. So I've been meaning to do mine for a long time, and now I'm going to start it. I just finished one for Amazing. Amina. Beautiful. Great. Yeah. Time to start things that are new. Yes, do what you enjoy. You're also inspiring me. I also want to start taking on something either with art or music. Amazing. I'm just Thank going to stop the recording. Um, if anybody um, 